Hello students, and welcome to this introduction to inverse relationships. Our objective today is that we will analyze relationships and determine if they vary directly or inversely using journal notes and practice problems. So first off, let's analyze this objective, right? So we have this objective, and it says that we're going to determine if they vary directly or inversely using our journal notes and practice problems. So I think the key here is that we need to know what directly and inversely mean. And so we're going to define direct versus inverse variation. So direct variation, and I'd like you guys to make sure that you have all these definitions in your journal um, before we get started here. Uh, direct variation is a relation in which one variable varies directly with another, such as when y is equal to kx. So in this case, k is some constant, and we can say that y is going to vary directly with x. So the form of this that you're used to seeing is y equals mx plus b, because m will be constant that whole time. So that is an example of your direct variation. All right, inverse variation is a relation represented by the equation of the form y is equal to x divided by k, or x is equal to y divided by k. So what this means is that your x and your y are actually going to uh, kind of flip-flop a little bit. So if we get k by itself, uh, we'll see that actually we might have something like this. You might have x over y is equal to k, or k is equal to x over y. So as one gets bigger, the other might have to get bigger as well or get smaller um, to be able to match the function. You might also have it of this form, where you have uh, x is equal to k divided by y, or y is equal to k divided by x. So those are all examples of inverse variation. All right, so our combined and joint variation, your combined variation is a relation in which one variable varies with respect to each of two or more variables. So this is things like y is equal to w x divided by k, or y is equal to w times x times k, where w and x are both variables. Joint variation is a little bit more specific. Uh, this is when a relation in which one variable varies directly with respect to each of two or more variables. So this would be specifically y is equal to um, x, w, k, right? So this example here is an example both of combined variation and joint variation. But combined variation, you see, has more examples in it than uh, joint variation. Joint variation is more specific. All right, so what we see in our examples, so we're going to do some examples here, is we're just going to, for examples one and two, identify the type of uh, relation that we have. So in this first example, we have y is equal to k times x times w. So we see that y varies directly with x, and also y varies directly with w, and we can say that y varies jointly with x and w. So k in this lesson, and for a lot of lessons in the future, k is a constant. So k is not a variable, it's some number, right? So it has a fixed value that will not change versus a variable which does not have a fixed value. Uh, so then we also have this example, number two, over here. And we'll look at this and we see, okay, well, I have a y here, I have an x here. Uh, so what we'll see is that x and y vary inversely. Okay, so x and y are going to vary inversely, and 
let's see exactly what that means. So if x and y vary inversely, it means that y times x is going to be equal to k. So I know that k is some constant. So if I just give k some number, right, like 30, then y times x will always have to be 30. So when the way that we can develop this function is that we have to determine which of these variables will, well, we'll just determine the values for the other variable by plugging in a value. So if x is 5 and we have to get to 30 and we're trying to solve for y, then y must equal 6. So that's the way that inverse variation will work here. Um, so if we're trying to uh, determine if this park cleanup project is varying directly or inversely, one thing that we can do is we can see at each of these data points, we can plug them in and see if they meet this condition over here, right? So we can see if they're going to equal k. So first we do 3 times 85, and 3 times 85 will give us 225. So I say 3 times 85 is equal to 225. And then we say 51 times 5, and that's also going to be 255. I'm sorry, that's going to be 255. And then that 3 times 85 was also 255. So both of those numbers were 255. So the second set, 5 times 81, is equal to 255. And then you say 12 times 21. That's going to be 252. And then you have 17 times 15. And that's going to be 255. Okay, so what we see here is that barring one small variation here at 12 times 21, um, we're getting the same number. So what I can say here is that the number of students and the time in minutes varies inversely. And that makes sense, right? This is a park cleanup project. There's only so much park to clean up. So the idea is that it's going to take more people less time to be able to do this. So that's, that's something that actually makes sense to us on a, on a basic level, is that there's only so much work to do. Um, and if we throw more people at it, then it'll take less time because we've got more people independently working to finish it. So these inverse relationships actually have a lot of applications for what we're doing in the future and also for just life in general. So what we're going to do now is solve some word problems that have inverse variation. All right, so for this first word problem, the number of bags of grass seed N needed to reseed a yard varies directly with the area A to be seeded and inversely with W, which is the weight of a bag. If it takes two three-pound bags to seed an area of 3,600 feet, how many three-pound bags will be needed to seed 9,000 feet? Square feet, that is. All right, so I know that A, right, so we say N needed to reseed a yard varies directly with A. So N is equal to K times A, and then it in and inversely with W. So now it's going to be K divided by W. So this will be our basic setup here. And we know that if we're having an area of 3,600 feet, so K times 3,600, zero, zero, and it's a three-pound bag, so we say three, uh, and it says it takes two three-pound bags. So our N, our number of bags, will be two. And now we want to solve for this k, this constant of variation. And then that will allow us to go and solve uh, with 9,000 feet. All right, so we plug all these numbers in, and now we're just doing algebra. So we're saying 6 is equal to k times 3,600 feet. And 
Now I'll divide both sides by 3600. And that will give me my k. So my k is equal to, we're going to call k uh, 1 over 600 for now. And this is approximately, um, what, what is that? 1 divided by 600, 0 0.00167. Now when you're working with your calculator, you need to make sure that you're putting this number in, that 1 over 600, because that will be much more accurate um, than this approximation over here. All right, so now we're going to try and solve for how many 3-pound bags will be needed to seed the 9,000 um, feet squared. So we know now that we're looking for n. So we're looking for the number of bags. So n will be our variable. And then k, I know, is 1 over 600. A, in this case, will be 9,000. And then our um, value here for the weight will still be 3. So it's still going to be a 3-pound bag. So all we need to do is actually plug this into our calculator. And we'll see that we'll need five bags. So we plug, we say 1 over 600 times 9,000. That gives us 15. So then this is equal to 15 divided by 3. And then we see that n is equal to 5. So we're going to need five bags. So this type of problem, you see algebraically it's not that difficult, however the setting up portion over here is the part that we really need to focus on. Alright, so for example 6, uh, we're going to do a, a, gravita a gravity problem. So we have this object, right, and we're talking about gravitational potential energy. And gravitational potential energy, which is the variable PE, is a measure of energy. PE measures directly with an object's mass, m, and its height, h, meters above the ground. Physicists use g to represent the constant of variation, which is gravity. Given that an object with a mass of 58 kilograms has 2,273.6 joules of potential energy at 4 meters, find the gravitational potential energy of a 65 kilogram object at 4 meters. All right, so you notice that what we don't know right now is gravity. Right? So we need to find gravity before we're able to do anything else. So first let's set up our equation. So it says PE, right, varies directly with an object's mass m. So we're going to say k, or actually we'll call this g since that's the variable that they use for their constant of variation, times m times h, because it varies directly with both the mass and the height. So we're trying to find g given a mass of 57 and a height of 4. So what we're actually looking at here, and I'm just going to draw it out real quick, is you have some height, 4 meters, and you have this object sitting up there, and it's got 56 kg, and we want to measure the amount of potential energy that that has. All right, so we need to isolate G, so we're going to say PE divided by MH will equal G. All right, so now we've isolated G so we can solve for it. So let's go ahead and plug in all of our numbers. So we know that our joules were 2273.6, and then we divide that by the mass, which is going to be 58 kilograms times the height, which is 4 meters. So we'll plug this in our calculator, and that will solve g for us. And quite unsurprisingly, what we find is g is approximately 9.8. So that's going to be our constant there. And this shouldn't be surprising to anyone who has a familiarity with uh, basic physics is because gravity is always going to be 9.8 on the Earth. But you see this process can actually be used to um, find gravity for any given object, which is kind of the interesting part of this. 
All right, so now that we have G, we need to plug in, and we're trying to find the potential energy of a 65 kilogram object at four meters. So we're trying to find potential energy now, and we know that potential energy is going to be 9.8, because that's gravity, times the mass of the object, which is going to be 65, times 4 meters. So we'll just take those three numbers, 9.8 times 65 times 4, and we'll find that the potential energy of this object is going to be 2548 joules. So as we see, the algebra is much easier in these problems, but the issue is making sure that we set up the equations correctly. All right, so your reflection today is to write two sentences over what you learned today and how you feel you understand it. Your assignment today is that you will ask me for a stamp for your reflection, and then you'll get started on our practice problems for the day. All right, if you have any questions, let me know, and have a wonderful day.